Hello everyone, it's another Q&A video today, uh, talking today about whether dysautonomia can be cured, uh, low testosterone in a female patient, and what was the other one? Oh right, and whether one needs to use red light to help uh, methylene blue work properly. So um, as per usual, nothing I'm saying should be construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. If you need medical advice, please ask your healthcare provider to get that advice, and if you don't mind, uh, take a quick moment to please like, share, subscribe, and or post a quick uh, comment on the video. I'd really appreciate it. So thanks you. thank you in advance for taking a second to do that. Uh, so the first question here is, uh, can you cure dysautonomia? So I posted a video a little while ago about, um, about dysautonomia, apparently, and um, very fair question. So um, obviously every case is gonna gonna vary um, and in my opinion and in my experience um, it really depends on what the timeline is like with the onset of the dysautonomia in the first place. So um, patients who you know, develop dys dysautonomia from a very young age where there seems to be um, a maybe a significant anatomical component so if say they have like pretty severe hypermobility um, spectrum disorder so like say they have you know, EDS or some other type of hypermobility syndrome um, and they have some pretty notable uh, dysautonomia symptoms um, with those patients and again generalizing here but in cases like that there's higher probability that they're going to need some kind of ongoing treatment and support um, over the course of time to manage their dysautonomia. Um, whereas patients who um, say were feeling just fine, they had no, let's say talking about POTS for example, um, let's say they were perfectly healthy until maybe they hit their 30s and then they you know, had a mold exposure and then they started developing a bunch of symptoms including POT symptoms. Well, that patient is much more likely to have a full resolution of their POTS uh, once the appropriate treatment is um, implemented um, as opposed to say the first example where, you know, say, you know, 15 year old, you know, they have POTS symptoms. Um, this could apply to other types of dysautonomia as well. I'll just use POTS as an example. Um, <clears throat> so they have POTS symptoms, they're super duper hypermobile, and they, you know, they're already developing POTS symptoms, and it doesn't seem to be related to some type of a, you know, Lyme, co-infection, uh, long COVID, um, mold exposure, like type of scenario. That's going to be much um, less likely that they're going to have a, be able to have a full recovery of that dysautonomia. Now, again, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying that it, it really depends on the case. So, again, depending on the history, that's going to dictate the prognosis to a large extent. So, um, the person who asked to the person who asked the question, um, if you wanted to give a little bit more background, you know, beyond you know. Can you cure the dysautonomia? Like what type of dysautonomia? What are some of the parameters around it? I'm happy to post another video that's a little bit more nuanced, but um, that's my kind of more general answer to that. So thank you for the question. Uh, the next question is about <clears throat> testosterone. So it says, I have low T as a woman and told that my issue is likely hormonal. Uh, one year of hormone therapy and I don't feel a difference and my levels are taking too long to increase, but I'm doing another year anyway. Um, so I guess there's not really a question. Oh, uh, all right, there it is. Um, any idea why my hormones, um, in parentheses, all of them are falling slash low? Um, can anyone recover completely from PCOS? So thank you for the questions. Um, so in my experience uh, with my patients, if there's no change with hormone replacement therapy, especially after a whole year of being on that HRT. Um, I'm not saying it's not a good idea to continue the HRT because if levels are still low with my patients, in, you know, it makes logical sense to me to keep on working to boost them up, but it really does suggest that there's some root cause issue that's um, not being addressed um, or that there's some other explanation for the ex uh, symptoms that they're experiencing. So most folks are gonna, you know, go on testosterone uh, therapy if they have lower energy levels or maybe they're having trouble putting on muscle mass potentially. There's other reasons too, but those, you know, maybe low libido might be another one. Um, but if those are the types of symptoms someone's experiencing and then they go on testosterone replacement therapy and there's no difference after a year, it really suggests there's probably something else going on as well. Um, and then what would it be that might be dropping that testosterone? Now, when a patient has PCOS, you know, oftentimes there are challenges with androgens in the first place. Um, so then that complicates things a little bit more as well. Um, but um, in terms of, you know, 
question being, you know, any idea why the hormones are falling slash low, like what might the root cause factor be? Um, you know, in, in my experience, um, it, again, it's, it's challenging, you know, not doing, knowing a full background, obviously, but in my experience, when I have patients with low hormone levels, um, <clears throat> oftentimes there's some type of more um, notable thing going on with their health history. Again, like I, I'm in a bit of a nuanced um, practice where most of my patients are suffering with complex chronic illnesses. You know, yes, many of them, you know, do a lot of sports medicine injections, injections for arthritis, uh, integrative oncology. I treat other things as well, you know, kids on the autism spectrum that are symptomatic, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, a lot of my patients are dealing with complex chronic health issues. And so when they have you know, hormones that are low, it's usually because there's something like you know, mold toxicity or Lyme or some chronic virus or something like that going on. Um, sometimes it can be stress related. Um, I've had a few patients who actually you know, have these you know, challenges with their pituitary glands that need to kind of go on these hormone reset protocols um, you know, where they're working with um, you know, uh, different types of bioidentical hormones, you know, beyond just treating what's low. Sometimes there's kind of like these hormone resets that are done with their endocrinologist um, in, in, in essence. Um, so it, it really depends on the, the specifics of the um, case. But um, in the majority of cases, there are solutions. Um, I've had patients where, you know, they would say, I have one patient I'm thinking of in particular, you know, just stopped having her period, um, did some testing, her hormones were just all rock bottom low, um, you know, put her on some low dose immunotherapy, she went on some um, specific type of birth control for a little bit, and like, you know, whatever the combination was of things that worked there, like she, you know, is menstruating regularly again, and everything's fine, she's off her treatment, so, you know, these are uh, scenarios that folks can bounce back from things can come back online but there of course could be other conditions that are not um, not able to be bounced back from depending on what's going on so um, again more more details uh, could give a little bit more of a more detailed um, answer but um, that those are those are some of the things that I've seen in my practice um, and then can anyone recover completely from PCOS um, so I think that to my understanding with PCOS, um, it's something where, you know, if, if a patient has PCOS, then they have PCOS, um, but the symptoms that are associated with P PCOS can be treated. I mean, of course, not every, there's no promises for any, every case that's out there, but um, there are patients with PCOS say, where their main issue is fertility challenges and they can, you know, go on to have um, children without um, you know, like with appropriate treatment, or um, maybe it's an acne issue, or maybe it's uh, just a lot of menstrual irregularities, and there are treatments that can be effective for those. And some cases are really, really tough to treat. So it's um, you know not not like a just slam dunk for every case, but um, there are there is the ability to treat PCOS. But in terms of actually no longer having that PCOS diagnosis, to my understanding, uh, I'm, I'm not aware of it being able to like quote unquote like go into remission per se. It's just more of a um, managing symptoms. That, that's my understanding of it. Um, it's not, not an area that I specifically specialize in, um, but that is my understanding of it from what I've learned and what I've seen in practice. So thank you for the question as well. And then the final one here is it says, so this is um, on one of my methylene blue videos, uh, methylene blue plus red light therapy equals magic, question mark. Um, 12,000 views, so thank you for all the love on that video. It's uh, one of my more popular ones. 99 comments now, um, including this one. So it um, says, if you are using methylene blue for cognition and brain support, do I need to shine the red light on my head or could I shine it on, say, my legs? Will it have a magnifying effect and help with cognition even if the body part I'm shining it on is not my head? Um, so thank you for the question. A very good question, very logical question. So my understanding with red light therapy is that um, it has very low penetrance, all things considered. If memory serves, I believe that red light, if it's like of a certain potency and if it's really concentrated, like if there's like a, a cold laser, like red light, um, which is going to be you know very, very focused, uh, very little scatter happening, um, I believe that, to my understanding, that's going to penetrate um, you know, approximately, a um, approximately a centimeter deep, give or take. Um, so not, not super, super, super deep. Um, so it's really going to be hitting more of those, um, or sorry, I think it's three centimeters deep. Sorry, my, my apologies. I believe it's three centimeters deep. Um, so, you know, not, not a whole lot of penetrance happening there. Um, and so it's not going to be getting, you know, super, super deep into a person's tissues. Nonetheless, um, 
there is it does seem to be a synergy with red light therapy and methylene blue um, and presumably that's because the methylene blue is getting into the circulatory system is getting into the bloodstream um, and then that red light is able to penetrate deeply enough to interact with the methylene blue having this photodynamic effect um, in the little capillaries and those little tiny blood vessels that are underneath the surface of the skin um, so it, it is able to have that systemic effect um, a person putting red light specifically on their head um, quite frankly um, even if the you know even if there was no skull that was getting in the way of refracting that light um, it's just it's just too too deep to like make a significant difference in that way so my understanding is that the um, red light exposure as long as it's hitting the skin and ideally maximizing the surface area as much as possible to kind of hit as much of the methylene blue that's floating around through the bloodstream it really to my understanding doesn't matter which body part you shine it on when you're going for more of those systemic effects from methylene blue and red light um, of course if a person has say a sore elbow you're going to want to shine the light on the elbow because that's going to be hitting you know more locally in the tissue but for more of a systemic effect i don't believe it matters where the red light is being shone at least that is my understanding of it and that's what i tell my patients uh thank you for the questions if anybody has any questions on these topics or anything else just post in the comment section below and i will do my best to answer as soon as i can